What's up, guys? How's everybody doing tonight? Are we good? Yeah? Nick, I'm all plugged in good and everything, right? You just need to fix my levels and stuff. Okay, you're good. All right. Hey, guys. Um, I'm excited to be here with you guys tonight. This is a message I've been looking forward to for um, quite a while. And um, we've been in this series, um, Elephant in the Room. And uh, the, the purpose of this message, guys, uh, or this series, uh, rather, the purpose of this Elephant in the Room series is uh, we've, we've felt, Colin and I have felt um, uh, a need to address topics that we feel like the church has done a poor job of addressing. Um, we want to share truths with you guys uh, that we read in the Bible that unfortunately um, some church leaders in the past um, have, have distorted um, and have just not been truthful about um, or have just turned a blind eye to things. Um, and so uh, tonight's message, um, Colin, how long ago would you say we talked about this series? Eight months ago? Yeah. So for the better part of the year, Colin and I have been talking about this Elephant in the Room series. And originally we were going to call it, somebody needs to turn the hazer off. Uh, originally we were going to call it Culture Clash. It was, it's going to get real thick in here. Um, oh, it might be off now. We're good. Okay. Uh, we were going to call it Culture Clash because uh, many of these topics um, are things that uh, like the church and then the world seem to be to have opposing views about, um, and that typically as Christians, we end up clashing with the secular culture, um, over these topics. Like last week we talked about the LGBTQ plus, um, topic and, um, you guys know, cause you've probably experienced it. You see things on the news. You might hear your parents or your family or friends talking about it, that typically the church looks like the enemy of the world. Um, and the world says that, like, man, hey, loving people is the right thing to do. And a lot of times the church has just said um, that, no, that's not true. Like, truth is the only way to go. And, and what we talked about last week is just the reality that, that Jesus shows us an example of love and truth. And that that's what we're called to do in our relationships with people. And so with topics like LGBTQ, um, we as believers are called to lovingly care for and be in relationship with people um, that we disagree with. And in doing so, by having relationship with them, we're able to show them the truth uh, and allow the Holy Spirit to do the work in their lives um, that he's going to do. And, uh, and so tonight... Um, we planned to talk about mental health. Um, and this has been, we decided not to call this series Culture Clash because we thought it was important not to continue uh, to add fuel to the fire to this idea that, man, it's us against them because we as believers should not be warring against the world. We shouldn't be at war with people that Jesus loves and died for, and they don't know him. The only thing we're at war against is sin and the power that sin has over people's life. And so we were like, we, we don't want to call it culture clash because it just makes it seem like we're against each other. And we don't want to be against the world anymore. We want to be different than the world. We want to be fighting against our own temptations to sin, but we're not fighting the people that God created. Does that make sense? So we decided to call it Elephant in the Room because it's like that big topic that everyone knows is there, but nobody wants to pay attention to. So we've, we've handled some pretty big topics. And so eight months or so ago, we started talking about this series. And one of the things that I suggested, or maybe Colin, I don't know, whoever, one of us suggested that we should talk about the issue of mental health. Um, because mental health and mental illness is a very real thing for a lot of people. And uh, I feel that at times the church in general has done a pretty poor job of sharing care, showing care and love for people that struggle with their mental health and their mental wellness. Um, and so we've been planning for this series for quite a while. Uh, and uh, mental health is something that I have, um, I have personal um, experience with. Um, 
I have always been kind of an anxious person, even when I was younger than you guys. The way I would respond to things would be in a very anxious way. I was always nervous about things. Um, I get hung up on the potential um, for things that could happen, even extremely irrational things. Um, and um, I, don't, I don't have time to tell you guys everything, but there have been some moments in my life that my anxiety has has been ramped up. Um, but the two biggest ones uh, in my life that have, have caused my anxiety to get um, out of control were someone from Richmond, California is calling me. I don't know them. Should I answer on mic? No, okay. No, 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 no. We don't have time for that. And it's probably going to be this is Express Scripts calling about your anxiety medication. <laughs> um, okay, so listen, listen. There have been two things. Um, just so you guys know, tonight's message is going to be a very personal one for me. And I want to just take this opportunity to tell you guys a story about some of the stuff God's been doing in my life and in the life of my family. Um, and, uh, and then we're just going to look at some truths that I've experienced and that I think the church needs to do a better job of sharing with people. So the two things that have happened in my life that have uh, been the most, that if looking back at this point in my life, have been the most monumental things um, as far as my anxiety is concerned is when my, my first son was born. Um, I've always had a lot of trouble sleeping, but then when Liam was born, uh, that just went to a whole new level because I would lay in bed at night worried about his safety and now here's this little thing that can't protect himself and it's my job to protect him and what if something happens outside of my control and then it got to the point where I would start to have vivid imaginations at night where I couldn't sleep and all I was doing was waiting for the moment listen for a car to drive through his bedroom window completely irrational but that's still a huge fear of mine I can stand here in front of you and honestly say that the chances of that happening are extremely slim, but I still struggle every day with the thought that that might happen or that something might happen to my kids. And then a few years after Liam was born, uh, many of you guys knew Pastor Eddie, uh, Colin's dad, and uh, and for those of you that were around at that time, I, I worked for Eddie in the children's department and um, and. Uh, one Sunday, Eddie was teaching, and he had a heart attack after uh, teaching in the first service, and, and Eddie was 39 years old when he died. And that played a big impact in my life. Um, David, thank you for the new picture on my iPad. <laughs> Well-timed. Um, that played a that played a big role in my life, and I think that's an understatement because uh, there are people like Colin and his brothers and his mom that obviously that impacted them in an even more profound way. But, um, but the thing, uh, on top of missing my friend and my mentor, uh, what that did for me was that it, it made me feel that God would take people from me um, just because. And um, I, for a while, and maybe still do, thought that um, God would take people from me just to teach me a lesson. Um, and that, hey, this is something I, I can learn from. And um, that's a pretty painful thing to believe about your creator. That they would take your friend from you, or your child from you, or your parent from you, just so that you can learn something. Um, and so that really, on top of the fears of something happening to my kids, that really compounded an issue. Um, and I had never considered up until that point, um, even after that, that I might have some sort of mental illness that needs to be dealt with. Um, and, uh, I have since then just been living with um, this anxiety and these fears, um, and I would have panic attacks at times. Um, and then when I would have a panic attack, then when it was done, I would get depressed because I felt ashamed 
um, and I felt that there was something wrong with me, and I felt disappointed in myself for having a panic attack, and I felt that I should be more on top of my emotions. And it has just, for the last few years, continued to grow. Um, and my wife knew about these fears, and, you know, we talk about things, and obviously she's my wife, so she knows if I'm not sleeping. And, um, but we never talked about, like, maybe, maybe we need to talk to some professional about this. And then this summer, in August, um, after Colin and I had months prior already agreed uh, or, you know, talked about, hey, we're going to have this mental health uh, conversation. Um, I happened to be on vacation, and just the way it worked out with my family's schedule, I was on vacation by myself for a couple days, and then my, my wife and kids were going to come meet me when they were done with work and school. And, um, and I ended up being alone in a house by myself, uh, away, out of town, away from anyone. Uh, and I had um, what I would describe as de a debilitating panic attack um, where I couldn't sit down, I couldn't eat, I felt like I couldn't breathe or that I might be having a heart attack. Uh, and I just was pacing around the house. E everything seemed wrong uh, and like I was out of breath and dizzy and you name it. Uh, and I was scared and I didn't know what to do. So I called my wife and um, I called I called my wife Susan and uh, and uh, you know I was like hey I'm pretty sure I'm having a panic attack and I don't want to stay at this house by myself because I I think that's what's triggering it and she was like yeah but you can't drive and I was like yeah I, I don't know I, I don't know what to do because I can't stay here by myself and I know I I can't drive if I'm not safe so I ended up calling my mom and I said hey mom um, I think I'm, I, can I ask you a question? I said, I think I'm having a panic attack. And she said, you are. I can hear it in your voice. And um, I said, I want to come home, but I don't want to drive if I'm not safe, right? And so, um, you know, kind of fast forward, she, we ended up uh, talking it out. And once I made the decision that I was going to come home as soon as I felt safe to do that, my panic attack went away. And I was able to just pack up my stuff drive home without a problem, come home, had a few more panic attacks over that weekend, and it was pretty clear by the beginning of the next week that I needed to go to my doctor. And so I went to my doctor, and my doctor uh, immediately put me on some anti-anxiety medication that takes about seven or eight weeks to get into your system, and so began taking it. Fast forward seven weeks, um, which would be about a month ago now, uh, I began having seizures, um, and um, you might, if you guys have heard of Tourette's, you might consider these seizures kind of like Tourette's. Um, I started having like some uh, physical ticks at times. I would have kind of a ticking attack uh, where I would tap things or, or whatever, and I'd have verbal ticks um, where uh, I would just kind of repeat the same noise over and over again. And some of them were so bad that my body started seizing up to the point that I w fell off the couch a couple times. And had I been standing up and not, not caught myself, I could have fallen straight to the ground. My entire body would lock up. You imagine if your entire body cramped up, right? So went to the doctor immediately and was like, what's wrong with me? And um, she said, okay, here's the deal. You're actually having a pretty rare side effect to the anti-anxiety medication that we've put you on. So she said, we're going to wean you off of that. And uh, in the process of weaning you off of that, here's another medication that's going to help with those attacks. All right? Um, that medication I was instructed to begin taking right away. That was a Thursday that I saw my doctor. Friday was the first day that I was taking that medication. And... Um, that day, there were parts of the day that I lost track of time. Um, I left the house without knowing it and don't know where I went for periods of time. Um, I went to Central's football game that night. So if any of you were at, um, it was like the elementary school cheer night, you know, when they, they cheered during halftime. So we went to that. So if any of you saw me that night and you, I talked to you, 
and you thought, AJ seems like he's on drugs. <laughs> I kind of was. The problem was they were prescribed to me and they weren't working correctly. I went home, um, told my wife, because we hadn't eaten, eaten dinner, I said, um, I need to get us something to eat. So I went out to get food. I should not have left the house again. Um, and then I came home and I remember putting the food on the counter and the next thing I know, um, I'm opening my eyes on, in my living room, laying on my back um, with my wife and one of our friends it is like holding my head in their lap. And they're saying, it's okay, we're gonna take you to the emergency room. So I ended up going to the emergency room and they figured out what the problem was right away, gave me a shot um, and, uh, and began a few day process of getting off of those medications. Um, so, a couple things. A couple weeks ago, I was gone for like two and a half weeks. That's where I was. Um, I was recovering from this medical episode. Um, but through that time, the two and a half weeks or so that I was at home recovering, getting healthy, um, working on what was going on, um, God began really speaking to me in that process. And um, I know that I know a lot of things. I know everything. Um, Kayla, <laughs> I'm a six. <laughs> oh, my, my wing five is showing, yeah. Okay, so I know some things. And one thing I know is that I, I wish I didn't have to have had these experiences. Um, but another thing that I know is that God uses everything that happens in our life to make things work for his good and for him to be glorified. And so I know that God was speaking to me and has been speaking to me and has been working through myself and my family through this process. And so there's just some things that I want to share with you guys that I've been learning. Can we do that? Thank you guys for listening so intently. When I was your age, um, I began having these anxious feelings. I just didn't know it was anxiety. I thought I was just afraid of things. I, I already kind of mentioned that. And my pastor at the time directed me to a Bible verse, which has become my life verse, my favorite verse in the Bible. Um, but it has been a process of almost 20 years of me learning really what this verse means. And I believe that I continue to like uncover and learn from God what he's trying to teach us in this verse. So it's Philippians 4 verses 6 through 7. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. See, initially when I heard this verse, and for years I kind of got hung up on it because I thought what this verse was saying was, you don't need to be anxious. If you're feeling anxious or having anxiety, all you have to do is pray and ask God for those fears to go away, and then they will. And I've come to understand that that's just not true. This verse is not saying that, hey, you don't have anything to worry about, right? Right? This verse is not saying, like, hakuna matata, right? Once you become a believer, you don't have anything to worry about. When you become a believer in Jesus, you don't have anything to be afraid of. Nothing bad will happen in your life. And that's just not what this passage is saying. What this passage is saying is that even though there are times that you're afraid, when you go to God through prayer and you present those requests to Him and you tell Him what you need, He offers you a peace far beyond anything that we can understand. But that's the hard thing. Because we want the kind of peace that we want. I want these visions of my children being hurt to go away. And I don't understand why sometimes when I pray and say, God, can you make those fears go away? They don't just disappear. But God is saying to us in this passage, I offer you a peace that's better than the peace you think you need. I offer you hope that is far grander 
than the minuscule human version of hope and peace that you desire. I know what you need better than you know what you need. So when it says don't be anxious about anything, it's not saying, hey, just be good enough and your anxiety will go away. It's saying don't be anxious about anything because I've got it figured out. And tonight I want to just take a few minutes here with the time that we have left to talk about, like, what does God want us to know about our mental health? Because for a long time, and we're going to get to that in a minute, this is one of your upcoming points. We're not quite there yet. But for a long time, the church has just kind of said things like, well, if you have anxiety, that means you don't pray enough. Or you don't believe in God enough. You don't have enough faith. And it's just not true. It's just not true. Anxiety is not something that some people choose to have. It's not something that they think seems fun or that they get stuck with because they sin. Anxiety is a sickness. Depression is an illness. We, for a long time, have tried to make people feel like illness only happens from the neck down. We get the flu. People get cancer. We get, I don't know, ingrown toenails, whatever. But we've neglected the fact that there are people, many of us, that could be sick from the neck up. And there's nothing wrong with that. So your first fill-in that I want you guys to know is that if you're struggling with your mental wellness, there is nothing wrong with you. If you're struggling with thoughts that you have or fears that you have, it does not mean that there's something wrong with you. If you had the flu, Stevie, if you had the flu, would you think that there's something wrong with you? Other than I have the flu, right? If you had the flu, you wouldn't be thinking, what sin did I commit in my former life that has caused me to have the flu. There's no former lives. You guys get the, you guys get it. Don't get hung up on that. (laughs) Right? And the same is true if we have a mental illness or a mental health struggle is that there is nothing wrong with us other than we are sick and we need to see a doctor, see a trained professional that can help us. See, I started that medication, and, and then obviously that didn't work out. So my doctor was like, okay, no more, no more medication for right now. But I've been going to counselors. I've been seeing one of my former pastors who does like a prayer counseling ministry. I'm going back to my doctor in a couple weeks. So all of a sudden, there's three people that I'm seeing on a weekly basis because I'm sick. And I need people to help me get better right? There's nothing wrong with me. I'm not a bad person. I might be kind of weird, but that's beside the point. The next thing that I want you guys to fill in, and this is a huge one, this is a lie that people have been told from the pulpit, okay? From the stage in church. That's what a pulpit is, all right? Mental illness does not equal a lack of faith. Mental illness does not equal a lack of faith. If you are struggling with your thoughts, with fears, with anxieties, with depression, with self-harm, that does not mean that you don't believe in God or that you haven't prayed enough or that you're not saved or that you need to just do and be better. It does not equal a lack of faith. And likewise, your next feeling is admitting that you struggle does not make you a bad Christian. There is this lie, this idea that if you were to admit to people that you trusted, that are fellow believers, if you admitted to them that you're struggling with something, that that makes you a bad Christian. I have known people 
that have been told by, a, by people at a church, oh, you think you have anxiety? Oh, you just need to pray more. That's ignorant. That is ignorant thinking, and it is not true. Imagine going up to someone who had cancer and saying, you should pray better. Like, I would punch that person in the throat if they said that to me. That might be part of my mental struggles. I think I can get away with things now. I'd be like, sorry, bro, panic attack, had a Tourette's freak out, punched you right in the nose. Right? You accidentally robbed a bank. That might be pushing it. Admitting that you struggle does not make you a bad Christian. Struggles with your mental health. Likewise, admitting that you're struggling with temptation does not make you a bad Christian. God created us for relationship with each other, and we're created to struggle through difficult things arm in arm with each other. All right? Here's the next fill-in. Anxiety and depression are liars. Anxiety and depression are liars. Now, I've talked a lot tonight about how, like, anxiety and depression, they're, they're, you know, they're just a sickness. That is true. But one of the ways that we fight them is by telling ourselves the truth. And anxiety and depression just cause us to lie to ourselves. Right? I have thoughts that I know are completely irrational. And one of the best things that I can do for myself is stop myself, breathe, and just tell myself, okay, AJ, that's not happening. I had like a moment the other day, yesterday morning, where like, because this is how it happens for me. I get up in my head and I start telling myself, I start building these stories in my head. And then I started to have like a panic attack thinking about what if my son fell into the Grand Canyon. And I literally had to stop myself and go, we're not at the Grand Canyon. Like, the, I can avoid that. Right. Just don't go to the Grand Canyon. I've been. It's dumb. It's just a big hole in the ground. Look at pictures. You can't fall into a picture. Like I had this moment where I had to stop and go, oh, that's not happening. But it had become like this like unavoidable thing in my head where I was like, I don't don't know what I'm going to do. Jake's going to fall in the hole. (laughs) What? Anxiety and depression lie to us and they, they get us to believe things that just aren't true. The next thing, guys, fill this in. I'm trying to go quickly because this is a lot of info. Medication is not the enemy of faith. Medication is not the enemy of faith. Now, disclaimer with that. That's what I believe. But I'm 32 years old and I get to make my own decisions about my health. You guys are minors. And if your parents don't want, if you feel like you're struggling with something and your parents are saying, we don't want you to be on a medication, that is up to them, not you. But I would have honest conversations with them about how you're feeling. But medication is not the enemy of faith. Taking anxiety medication is not you saying, God, you're not big enough. Right? You guys get that? I know people that, like, don't go to the doctor and stuff. Like, and, and like, when, when the lady, when she gets pregnant, you know, they, like, she doesn't go to the doctor. You know? Because, like, you don't want to play God. And my response to that would be, like, God created doctors. <laughs> okay? So it's cool. Right? Medication is not the enemy of faith. And then two more points that are important for you to remember. And I want you guys to all look up here before we go write them down. The next thing that you need to know, that all of us need to know, is that no matter what we're feeling, if we're struggling with our mental health and our mental wellness, 
is that you are not alone. I have experienced how lonely anxiety and depression can make you feel. But the reality is that there are a lot of people in the world that are sick. And like I said earlier, God created us to be in relationship with each other and struggle through hard things with each other. God created us to go through life together. On top of that, if you struggle with anxiety, depression, whatever mental struggle you may be dealing with, you're not the only person in the world that is struggling with that. And for some reason, there's just this stigma, this stereotype, and this feeling that I can't share that with anyone because they'll think that I'm weak and nobody understands and that everyone's just going to think I'm weird if I tell them those things. But you're not alone. Leaders, I didn't tell you guys I was going to do this, but I tricked you into it a little bit. Earlier in our leader meeting, I asked you guys, uh, how many of you have been affected by a family member or even yourself struggling with some sort of mental wellness struggle? So I'm going to ask you guys again, how many leaders know someone or have been personally affected by mental health issues? Every single leader in this room has been personally affected by mental health issues, either in themselves or, or in someone else. Travis is calling me. Not a good time. Right? You're not alone. There are people that you can talk to. There are friends that you have that are struggling with some of the same struggles. Okay? And then the last thing that I want you guys to fill in is that you matter. Because one of the lies of anxiety is that you're just messed up and, and you were a mistake. And it's just not true. You matter. God created you on purpose. And we get sick. We struggle with things. But that's not God saying, I don't care about you. You matter. All right? So there's a couple verses that um, we were going to talk about, but I want to give you guys time in your small groups to talk about them, okay? One of them was the one we already read, the Philippians verse. And so I hope that after tonight, you guys can have a little bit better understanding of what that verse is teaching us. That God offers us peace and hope through dark times. He doesn't always take those dark times away, but he offers us peace and hope through them. And then the second passage there that you guys have on your outlines in 2 Corinthians, I didn't have time to get into it, but basically it's Paul talking about this struggle that he had and that he prayed that God would take it away and, and God didn't take it away. And he learned through that to thank God for those weaknesses because, because of those weaknesses, he could allow God to be glorified. And so that's what I'm cho choosing to do with the things that I'm struggling with. And I hope you guys can start to learn about that and start to choose to let God be glorified in your own lives. All right? Let me pray for you guys. And then you guys are going to head into your small groups, okay? Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for tonight. And... Uh, God, I thank you for the way that you use painful, painful things in our life. Um, I thank you that you're bigger than those things, um, than you love us more uh, than we imagine, and that uh, even in difficult, hard, painful, lonely situations that you're there uh, to offer us a peace that just goes beyond anything that we could understand. So be with our small groups tonight. Be with our conversation. Uh, God, I just pray that, um, that these students' hearts and minds would be open to you tonight um, and that, that if anybody's, like, struggling with anything, that they would feel comfortable to talk to their leaders about it, um, to ask for prayer, uh, or 
to just learn more about um, about how you care about them. So I, I, I hope, God, that that eyes have been opened tonight and that we've uh, maybe been able to kind of counter um, counter some lies that the world and other people and even other parts of the church have told us. So, God, would you just speak truth tonight? Um, and Holy Spirit, would you do your mighty healing work in us? We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.